Mega Man comic issue 50. What in the world was he thinking wasting an entire page on Sigma being happy that he's gonna get a lot of power? He already bragged about that in the last issue. So we see the two worlds seeming to crash into each other. At least it looks cool. But obviously if that was literally what was happening, they'd destroy each other immediately from their own gravity. And I still can't get over how stupid Mega Man looks. It's not how you picture this whole scenario to be. Seriously, they're from separate universes and they're appearing in the same physical space as each other. That's not how you illustrate that. Because it's more like they're in slightly different physical spaces from each other. So Mega Man tries to hit Sonic with the Wrecking Ball from Sonic 1. Aside from the fact that it's him using it, that's so overdone. But Mega Man has to run out of new attacks at some point after last issue. It'd be ridiculous if he used each of his attacks only once. But I could do without that attack ever being seen again. So Sonic tries to spin dash the Mega Man while he puts his decoy barrier up. Which, when Knuckles hit one of those, it sent him and his friends away in an explosion that knocked them out. So, you'd think Sonic would be knocked out immediately after this. Because he'd be fast enough to attack it and not know what's good for him. Of course, the fact remains that there's no excuse for Sonic not being the one to make the first move, because he would have the fastest reaction times. He would have made the first move and spin dash to him immediately. And again, we all know Mega Man's weak to spikes, while even said so in Worlds Collide. So an entire plot around them fighting can't possibly make sense to last more than two seconds. So while this is going to be interesting because they've got more powers than last time, its logic fell apart from the first move. I like that Amy and Tails were smart enough to figure out immediately that this was in fact Sonic, and not assume it was the new robot Sonic. Sally says that it seems like a bunch of these robots have been fighting that Sonic robot. Why is she assuming this? They don't look visibly damaged, and they didn't tell her that. It's annoying that Bubble Man wants to attack Antoine and the others because they're animal people, like he just assumes they're about to attack them. But at least this finally establishes an actual personality for one of the Robot Masters. Proto Man's smart enough to immediately tell him not to antagonize them. I assume the robots will listen to him, because they're supposed to be good guys, and that'd be smart. It'd create padding if they attacked them. Then we see a wall fall apart and some humans fall out, and Sally immediately tells Bunny and Emerald to save the civilians. I'll just call him Emerald. Bunny flies and carries a girl to safety, while Emerald carries a part of the fallen wall with people conveniently standing on top of it. So why did the wall fall apart? Why did it glow with yellow light with lightning around it? I guess it's supposed to be because the two worlds are fusing together, and so only a part of the skyscraper came to the other world. Like, if the two planets were literally colliding, you'd be able to see one of the planets from the other. I love how this happened to right away prove to these robots that the Freedom Fighters are good guys. It's good pacing. I'm glad the writer resisted the urge to pad out the arc even more by having them all fight. But I shouldn't have to compliment that. Also, if you had no familiarity with Emerald, how is the text box Super Gizoid supposed to tell you anything about him? You'd be asking, what's a Gizoid? Then Sally screams and puts her hands over her ears for no apparent reason. And then Flashman carries her all of a sudden and says they stopped time long enough to get her out of the way. What happened? There's no excuse for not showing us what happened. I can only assume that a wall almost fell on her. Too fast for her to get out of the way. I like that the Robot Masters have to adjust to the fact that these guys are animal people, with Flashman calling her a woodland woman. And Bunny's gotta adjust to the fact that these robots are good guys. Oh, what a coincidence! It turns out Sonic and Eggman are fighting right outside of Dr. Light's house. How convenient. So he immediately walks out of it, and he and Flashman tell Sally who Mega Man is. Again, this is surprisingly good pacing. That doesn't make up for anything, though. Speaking of that, out of nowhere, a Genesis portal opens up right near Sally, and Six and the X characters go through it. Meeting them instead of the portal taking them straight to Sigma for some reason. When they're specifically following Sigma's trace. It's already confusingly unlikely that Orbot knew exactly how to get them to the right dimension out of all other dimensions. I guess any location on this planet was equally likely to have a portal open up in it. They're lucky they got sent here and not to the bottom of the ocean. So Six is going to meet the Freedom Fighters outside of the Sonic Boom comic? Well, I guess it makes sense to make sure people who don't read that comic will get a chance to meet her and see the crossover. It's smarter to have it in a comic more people read. The Boom comic got cancelled really early due to low sales. 
Almost like it's whole bad comedy direction with financial poison or something. And I still mean what I said about the scenes before this point being pointless. You could have not read the story where Six met these guys, and not read the two scenes where they were before this, and you wouldn't be lost and confused when they showed up. You would have missed nothing. So this should have been the first time we saw them. Also, I just realized how stupid it is that comedy chimp and that beaver no one likes came into the portal with them. They can't fight. I naturally assumed that Six and these guys wouldn't follow them because they're going to another universe and it's not their fight, it's X's. A paranoid person like Styx would never go into a portal to another universe when she has no reason to think she'd ever be able to get back home. I'd never do it. Wait, his name's Fastidious Beaver? Not Facetious Beaver? Oh, whatever. He sucks either way. So I got his name right the first time, and then got it wrong afterwards. Both words are accurate, and look really close to each other. And Facetious is more used a word than Fastidious anyways. X and Styx's dialogue immediately makes it obvious that they're the good guys because they want to prevent a disaster because of Sigma. Styx gets excited and calls Dips and saying, take us to your leader. I like her. I love that Sally's the one who first introduced herself to X. It makes sense because she's a princess. And unlike Styx, Sally immediately gets that these guys are good guys based on their dialogue because she's smarter than her. But it's gotten annoying that there's been practically no focus on Sonic's fight so far. It's an action series, and we haven't even been seeing it progress in the background. Then we see a federal prison full of humans. And a few of them look scared at suddenly standing on pieces of Green Hill Zone. And there's purple liquid below them. And I guess that's a tube from Chemical Plant Zone specifically. It'd be immediately recognizable if the liquid was pink. Because that's how Mic Mac is supposed to look. SEC got that right. Instead, that just reminds me of the Genesis Portal. And I'm just thinking that if this is really what's happening to this world, there's no way a ton of people wouldn't be killed from parts of the other world telefragging into them. I'm so glad I don't have to see that. Well, the comic isn't saying that doesn't happen, so it's not a plot hole. How the hell did one of the prisoners know the worlds would cross over when he's been stuck in the cell the whole time? He says they can see what's coming because when he jumped into the time stream, apparently Mega Man 37, where this better make sense, his bionic eye was exposed to tachyons. Why just his bionic eye? And it's interesting that this is the second time we've seen the word tachyon. It was mentioned by Rotor in relation to a time machine 25 years later as well. Is this a real science thing that quantum physicists make up to explain time? Why is he saying this when he already knows this information? Why does Xander exist? He doesn't have an interesting personality, he's just a bad guy. Well, I can't help but be intrigued by him as he goes through a portal that conveniently appeared for him. Way more prisoners would escape through Genesis portals than him. He realizes he made that portal in the future, which is at least less contrived than it appearing for no good reason, like Genesis once. I guess. So he decides to walk through it. Wouldn't it be funny if he went on to become a baker or something and never committed crime again? Because he'd have to get a job to make money for himself after warping to another place. And it'd be easier to do that than risky plans. I doubt that'll happen, because that'd be subversive and waste the potential of a character who only exists to be a villain, when we already have Wily, who's basically the same character. I'm rooting for him to make an honest living and thus never have to deal with prison again, because he was lucky enough to escape, so why waste this opportunity? But that'd be too good to be true. So some squares show up from Mega Man's planet, and I'm pretty confused because Mega Man looks in pain as Sonic spin dashes past him, but aside from a slam word below him, there's zero indication he actually hit him. I guess he did? Is that why there's orange stripes on his chest? Because he hit him with the spikes? I don't understand why I didn't hit Mega Man head on and immediately defeat him. I can't find a fight between them enjoyable right now because every second it drags on makes no sense. It's not explained that he has the power up from Mega Man 7 that made him immune to spikes, which might be common sense of Eggman to give him. That would have explained why he'd even survive a single spin dash. But even then, Sonic's so much faster than him, there is no way he'd be able to try to attack Sonic at all. He'd just constantly keep hitting Mega Man. Instead, somehow Mega Man has the time to hit him with a hammer after seeing Sonic coming, as Sonic flies into spin dash form with no explanation. Metal Sonic made more sense because at least he has a jet engine for a chest. He just floats because of magic, but the problem is we were never told Eggman used the power of a Chaos Emerald or rings on him. I'm thinking that the only way these two being equally matched would make sense is if Mega Man had the spike armor power up and was upgraded to be just as fast as Sonic. 
But that can't be the case, and him being as fast as Sonic is obviously not how anyone would picture a fight between them to be. So it kind of is the point. Sonic says he's done with a gentle approach, but that just makes me wonder how he was able to choose to be gentle in the first place. He wasn't even really trying. I'm just wondering why he's even able to stand there and talk, instead of the two being completely focused on their new priority of fighting each other. They charge up lasers, and blast each other with them, and it turns out that they're magically deroboticized and simultaneously are given a message from Eggman and Wily, telling them that Sigma's the one who corrupted and humiliated them and they need to stop him. It's fascinating to see them telling Sonic to stop a bad guy for once. And it does make sense that their attacks would deroboticize each other because they're probably specifically made by Eggman for this purpose. I guess he used magical rings hidden in his base to make these magical attacks. But still, I have to wonder why, if it turns out he can make a laser given this message, he wouldn't just make the laser not deroboticize them, and instead just stop at turning them against Sigma. Like telling the heroes to fight Sigma. Either way, the second Sigma would see them deroboticize, he'd know something went wrong, and who else would he blame but Eggman and Wily? Their plan was stupid. They should have kept them roboticized, logically. I already pointed that out, though. It's weird that their fight ended so quickly with barely any actual fighting happening between them, when that was a big thing advertised. But considering how I was just distracted the whole time by how stupid it was that Mega Man was surviving against Sonic, I guess this was a smart writing choice. And you had to make them fight a little bit because that's what was marketed. But still, if they could just deroboticize each other with one attack, it's really stupid that they weren't programmed to just shoot each other right away instead of wasting time using any other attacks. So that means their entire fight is forced. Eggman was uncharacteristically stupid by just hoping they'd live long enough to think to use attacks that deer broadsides each other, when realistically, Megman would be popped by spikes long before that happened then. Sigma asks how they revert each other because such power should have vaporized them. Oh my god, this is gonna get so stupid. At least Sigma does figure out that Eggman and Wily sabotaged Sonic and Mega Man. And I guess Eggman and Wily were running away from Sigma the whole time they were whispering about their plan, so it justified they didn't hear them whispering. But he still should have heard them running away and gotten suspicious even faster. What I meant by this being stupid is that Eggman says that Sonic and Mega Man were supposed to revert each other here, after they unified the worlds. They did unify the worlds already. And if they're supposed to do it here, then why didn't Eggman and Wily specifically program them to only revert each other after they returned to the base? if apparently that was what they wanted. Wily says that he's glad the weapons harm or weakness worked just like they designed. He says they didn't know Sonic and Mega Man would be facing each other immediately after they unified the worlds. I guess because it was a coincidence they didn't predict that their cities happened to appear right next to each other. It was predictable to me, but that's because I know I'm reading a story, and I figured the pacing would be fast. Sigma sends Zeddy at Dragman and Wily, and I immediately wonder how two old men would possibly be able to outrun all the Zeddy. Eggman's in his 50s and fat, and Wily has white hair, and they're up against six magical people with armor that enhances them. I don't care if they got a head start, you'd think at least one of the Zeddy would be able to catch up with them, especially the purple one. And Zavik can hit the ground and send shockwaves to send people upwards, I guess the shockwaves only go so far, and it couldn't stop running to make them. And yeah, Sigma's a good point that such power should have vaporized Sonic and Mega Man, but it didn't because I guess the power was guided by magical spell rather than actually being electricity and heat like it looked like. I'm just wondering why the fucking hell it took so long to figure out their sabotage when surely you should have gotten suspicious the instant they started fighting each other. Like I naturally assumed. He was portrayed as smart up to this point, but here he's actually pretty slow. Sigma tells the Zeddy that he wants the doctors alive. That explains why he didn't put palms to them. I guess he was too arrogant to think they'd ever scheme against him like this because they risked their lives doing that. So he didn't think to put brainwashing armor on Eggman and Wily too. Maybe he was smart enough to realize that they'd never actually make armor that brainwashed themselves, and would just pretend to do it right. I didn't say it earlier, but them being brainwashed was the first time I ever felt sorry for the Zeddy. I wish it didn't have to be villains wasting their lives. Xena could be a beautician of some kind, and Zalmom could be a cook, and Zeke could grow a fruit orchard or mentor people. The rest of them are worthless though. How does Sonic know Megman's real name right away? That's insulting. It comes off as favoritism of him. And it wouldn't if we were told that Sonic wrote down his memories of the Archisonic reality in a journal, and that's why he still remembers worlds collide. This could make sense if he did that. It was good of him to ask him if he was okay. Sonic says the gun carrier is fusing with a government building. I wish he'd just call it a gun airship instead. 
Rouge flies while carrying someone reminds me of Topaz and says to abandon Chip. Well, I can't help but enjoy this issue. Probably because it all takes place in a setting I care about, not Skull Egg Zone. I don't know why the fuck made an entirely new setting for most of a crossover to take place in. The ruins half the point of making a crossover, so it's just about the characters meeting each other. At least here, the two sets of characters are being confronted with the other's reality, which is more interesting. How do anyone prefer worlds collide to this? Because while this arc's forced too, it's not like I'm pissed off and wary in every issue this time. An explosion happens, and Eggman freaks out about the mayor, and his name immediately destroyed the tone of the scene. Did Flint seriously name a major character after Chips? Cheese Chips. That's not exactly how it's spelled, but still, that's almost how it's pronounced. Well, that was Narmy. We all know he had to survive anyways because it's a kid's comic, where anything dark can happen aside from characters dying or getting ill. Then they draw a line. Sonic finds Shadow's inhibitor ring, and trails off and looks sad. As if he's assuming that Shadow didn't survive. I don't get it. Are we supposed to believe that everyone knows his inhibitor rings are made of really tough material that's immune to explosions? Even if that's the case, Shadow should be wondering where the other inhibitor ring is. The fact that only one is here proves that the obvious thing happened where for once Shadow remembered he has Chaos Control and used it to his full advantage. For once, he used Chaos Control to teleport himself and everyone around him to safety, so he can still do that without an emerald, when we've already been told that he has a limited teleport range without an emerald of his. So wouldn't it be breaking a rule if he was still able to teleport out of earshot of these guys? I guess he doesn't have that limitation with one of the inhibitor rings gone. At least it's sweet as Sonic to care about Shadow. He's clearly upset at the idea that he's gone. But it's so genre blind of him to assume that guy who can teleport whenever he wants wouldn't have warped away from a place the first chance he got. I guess he thought that Shadow didn't know it was about to explode. But teleporting away from a place would obviously be faster than trying to escape it normally. He must have wanted to escape. Sonic remembering worlds collide definitely wasn't worth it because all it did was cause him to waste an entire goddamn page on us recapping to Mega Man. It was common sense not to do this. It was sweet of Sonic to informally greet Roland Dr. Light and say that he's not making this up because he knows all of them. And I like that Mega Man shook his hand and they said it was good to meet each other. I definitely prefer this over them acting like rivals because Mega Man was being obnoxious and out of character when he was teasing him. It didn't show off the fact that he's a likable nice guy properly. Sonic's responsible enough to apologize for being out of it when he didn't have to, and Sally doesn't hold it against him at all. Definitely better than the last time he was roboticized, not like that's hard. I really hate that entire page is wasted. All these people shouldn't need Sally to tell them what's going on because they should already know by now. Well, I have to compliment that the Unity engines are shielded, and so they can't be shut down by the heroes right away. For once, a character had common sense because Sigmund told them to make them like that. The problem is, what's powering the Unity engines? At least the reality changing machine was powered by an emerald. And they shouldn't be making that look better. These engines are overpowered and have to fuse two planets together. We should have been told that Eggman powered it with not only the emerald he has, but also the Zeddy gathered every single ring on the Lost Hex and used them for the engines. It could also be explained that Eggman uses a bunch of stolen chaos drives to power them. The Master Emerald would be a much more logical battery for these engines, but it's shattered right now. It could be explained that some of the shards landed on the Lost Hex. What kind of a name is that anyways? I guess literally speaking, the Hex is the magical spell that forced this place to be a planetoid after separating from Green Hill Zone. How could you name a planet that and not explain that? My point is, this arc seems just as forced as worlds collide because it involves Eggman making an insanely overpowered machine with no proper battery. But at least here, it's possible to imagine that he got a ton of magical batteries for it because it's based on the Lost Hex, which has rings. While in worlds collide, he and Wily made that machine an entirely new dimension they just created which wouldn't have any rings for them to use. Sigma's still spying on the heroes with a flying camera he of course has and he thinks this lab is too well hidden, so they'll never find it before he powers up. I guess realistically they wouldn't, I can't imagine how they would, other than a Genesis portal conveniently showing up in front of them and conveniently leading straight to Sigma, which makes me laugh just thinking about it. But logically there would be a chance of that happening. He says that the doctors won't live to see the end of it all, so he still wants them dead, but he thinks he still needs them right now. 
But why would he still need them? He thinks this powering up is inevitable. This concept isn't even original. I've already seen the concept of a villain powering himself up with the power of two different planets. And it was Eggman himself who was doing that. Sucking the life out of Earth and Mobius in Sonic the Comic. So a tree fell over and died. He gave himself omnipotence. He could be faster than Sonic to attack him and even turn Amy to an old lady. And he wanted to destroy the whole world. So he was definitely at his most threatening. And it felt great to see the main villain of the Sonic series be treated with such respect. The second you saw him again after finding out the plants were dying, he was already powerful enough to blast lasers through his allies. Now it's Sigma doing it, and it has no impact at all. I'm not seeing any plant life die or told about it, and he seems no different at all. And he just popped up out of nowhere for the sake of this one story arc. How are Wily and Eggman supposed to survive, by the way? If they were smart, logically they'd have inventions to save themselves. Force fields, ray guns, a portal gun. A button to override the Zeddy's brainwashing to be on their side instead. Sigma says he's got an army of his own, but I'm too distracted by my confusion over how Eggman's supposed to survive after this. Since apparently he's hiding behind an animal capsule when I assumed he'd long since run out of the base by now. I pictured his base to be way smaller than this. Sadly, there's another story after this, which I've already seen on YouTube, and it's completely worthless, so I don't know why they wasted comic space on it. We see Megman training with X to stop Sigma, when neither of them should think they need training at this point. Okay, so all the training stuff is worthless padding. And X thinks Mega Man doesn't look like he was initially built for combat. How would he know? And how in the world was his copy chip meant to help Dr. Light with lab work? And oh god, this was just an excuse to show us the moment when Mega Man first decided to go fight Wily by himself. I didn't need to see this boar fest. This is worthless. Sure, it's sweet that X and Mega Man are like big brother and little brother. But there's no plot. It's just lazy, uncreative reiteration of what the game fans already know. So there's nothing to say. Any fanfiction writer could write this. Where these two characters already established meet each other and tell each other their backstories. The only people this could possibly be appealing to are people who are totally unfamiliar with both of these characters. And a lot of those people wouldn't bother reading this because it's just Mega Man characters. And then X wastes everyone's time telling Mega Man his backstory. We could have assumed the characters were taking Sigma seriously. Oh, finally the story gets somewhere. X says that he wants to warn Dr. Light not to build him, because without him, there would be no Reploids, Mavericks, and constant war. Mega Man idiotically says that the future needs him to protect it. Even though it's so fucking obvious, the only thing he needs protection from is all those bad guys he just mentioned. This is like, the writer noticed what would logically happen if X met Dr. Light. And yet, he's gonna refuse to write it. Because of course it'd be sad if X, a well-known character, essentially killed himself by going to warn Dr. Light that building him would be a mistake. But that's obviously what would happen if he traveled back in time. There's no question about that. He's totally the self-sacrificial type, even Zero is, so he bit off more than he could chew. He wrote himself into a corner by making an entire story arc about this happening. If this was a fanfiction, he could write whatever he wants, and it could be as few stories as he wanted, so it could make sense. Mega Man at least says that he doesn't know what else Wily might have hidden away for the future, and so X will need to be around in the future to fight those potential bad guys. The only bad guy Wily hid away for the future was Zero, and he was dealt with. Zero would have been defeated eventually anyways. Why would Wily hide away things for the future when that wouldn't benefit him because he'd be dead by that point? That's dumb. I don't know why Mega Man wouldn't exist in the future. I guess he got destroyed and that's why X got built to replace him. Who would have destroyed him? Zero? Because X only woke up a really long time after classic Mega Man was built, so Zero couldn't have been rampaging all that time. That'd be stupid instead of him fighting him right away. And Zero doesn't act guilty around classic Mega Man. I guess he barely remembers his time as Evil Zero. My point is, Evil Zero wasn't worse than Sigma. Also, I consider Zero to be a Reploid, effectively. So isn't X technically wrong when he says there'd be no Reploids and Mavericks without him? Because Zero is a free will robot and started out as a Maverick. But that's a technicality. I'm just wondering why Dr. Light wouldn't have simply rebuilt Mega Man Classic if he ever got destroyed in the future, rather than building X the replacement. Mega Man must have gotten completely vaporized or teleported to entrapped in another dimension. He also had no reason not to rebuild Roll, and yet she's not in the future. 
I guess she existed for at least as long as Dr. Light did. And, and she outlived him. Also, it's completely forced that Mega Man X said the exact same thing. Twice. That's too much of a coincidence, even if they have the same personality. Because there's multiple ways to phrase something. The first story was by Ian Flynn. It was actually barely about Sonic Mega Man fighting. Most of it was actually the heroes of the various two universes meeting. And the pacing is fast, because they immediately discover they're good guys. The fight itself was very short, but if all that had to happen for them to de robotize each other was one panel, then there is no logical excuse for them not being programmed to have just done that at the time Eggman wanted, which was apparently once they go to Sigma's base, and not right after they unified the worlds. Logically, this whole plot would have been a lot shorter because they wouldn't have fought, they would have gone to Sigma and then turned themselves back to normal when laser attack. Even before Wily said that line looked like an idiot, the story felt forced because I was just wondering why Sonic wouldn't get Mega Man killed in a single attack. Not de roboticize him. He wasn't intending to de roboticize him. So my enjoyment was hindered by the plot being illogical the whole time, and the fact that Mega Man looked stupid, which is not how you picture a fight between them to be. But I like seeing their friends meet each other and react realistically instead of instantly fighting. And I appreciated seeing them use powers against each other, besides just their default attacks. So the fight looked more creative than the one Worlds Collide, which was boring and frustrating as hell. The second story was by Ian Flynn, and there was barely anything to talk about with it. 99% of it just recap. Every Mega Man fan already knows the backstory to Mega Man. It's like this is written by Amacho. Why would Flynn dedicate an entire story to this? Of course they'd all say this to each other. I guess it'd feel like they never really talked to each other if they didn't say this. But the story could have cut past them recapping their backstories instead of wasting entire pages. So they could have still canonically said this. Literally, the only interesting part of the story was that X considered getting himself killed because he thought about warning Dr. Light not to screw over the world by making him. What's worse, a billion evil robots and something crashing into the Earth apocalyptically, or one or two future threats of Wileys that might not exist that could be missiled to death by the military?